Thank you for listening to this recent message from the Rescue Church. We pray that God will use this message to encourage, challenge, and inspire you on your faith journey. If you'd like to learn more about the Rescue Church, please visit us online at therescuechurch.com. Well, I just want to say good morning, Rescue Church. Um, regardless of which campus you're joining us from, it is truly an honor to have you, have you here with us today. As you can tell by looking up here, I am not John. Um, if you don't know who I am, my name is Tyler. I am the Garrettson campus pastor. And I just want to share with you guys something really cool happening in the Garrettson campus. Uh, for the first about two years that we were in the community in Garrettson, we were meeting in a, in a building on Main Street. And, and this is a building that has kind of two storefronts to it. And what happened in under two years is we outgrew this building. So it's been incredible watching God give us growth. And what we've done for the past, this is actually going to be the fifth Sunday that we're portable. We have moved everything for our service over to the local school. Now, one of the most incredible benefits about being at the school is the amount of space we have. So I want you to think about this for a moment. We have an entire gym for our kids and an entire gym for the worship service. On top of that, we actually have like, like a real parking lot, like a real parking lot that you can park in that has lines. And to the side of this parking lot, there is a playground. And, and what I want you to notice in all of this space is kids love to run. Um, kids love to scream, and every Sunday they have as much space as they want to run and to scream. And what I notice about our kids, especially rescue kids age, four years old through the fifth grade, they like to run, they like to scream, and they also like to race. So one of the roles I've taken on in the Garrison campus is the race officiator. So I'm a campus pastor, I kind of oversee technology, and now I oversee races in the Garrison campus. So for a couple of Sunday mornings, I'd be hanging outside, greeting people, and like three, four, five kids would come out and they would want to race. So this is what my job consists of on a Sunday morning. I stand there, we have a long sidewalk that goes past the school, and I say, ready, set, go. I put my hands out, the kids run to the end of the building, come back, whoever touches my hand first, win. So I'm the race officiator. Now, during one of these races, I noticed when one of the kids won, they kind of bragged about it. They boasted a little bit. And I thought to myself, you know what? I'm going to step up to the big leagues, okay? I'm no longer going to be the officiator, but I'm going to win some races. So I don't know what, what this says about my mind that I wanted to beat a bunch of little kids in a race, you're probably thinking, well, Tyler, you're an adult, so what you would do is you would race the kids and you would let them win so they feel good about themselves. Nope, like I wanted to win. So I have been in multiple races in the Garrison campus, and can I tell you guys something? I have won every single time, right? And like no one's clapping. Yeah, you don't have to clap for that, but I have won every single time. You may be saying, Tyler, Here's the thing, the, the legs of these kids are half the size of your legs. You can stretch your legs farther, you can run faster because you are much older than them. It doesn't matter, I still win all the races. Whatever you wanna say, I have won every single time. Now, if we wanted to make these races a, a little more fair, I have some bags over here, okay? And these bags, they're filled with books. So they're not groceries, they're filled with books and these bags are extremely heavy. Um, what I mean by that is if I hold these bags too long, I can almost guarantee they are going to rip, they are going to break. So if we wanted to make this race a little bit more fair, if I got to the starting line, someone said go, and I ran this race carrying these bags, I can tell you some things that are going to happen. First, I'm going to lose. Like, I can't even beat kids if I'm holding bags filled with books. The other thing that's probably going to happen is these bags are going to rip open while I'm racing. They're going to fall at my feet. I'm going to trip I'm going to bust my mouth open, and I'm going to be preaching that Sunday without teeth, and I'm going to be broke because I don't have the greatest dental insurance, right? So it's not going to be a good thing. If I run with these bags, I'm going to stumble. I'm going to injure myself. I might not be able to race again if I break my leg, and that's how we can make the race a little bit more fair. Some of you would laugh at me when I fell because you're heartless. Um, others of you would actually feel bad for me, but what I want you to see in this picture is this is how many of us live the Christian life. You see in the book of Hebrews, the writer says that the Christian life is a race. 
a race that you and I need to run with endurance, a race that we need to run while keeping our eyes on Jesus Christ. And many of us look to Jesus and we're running this race, but in the process we're carrying all these heavy bags and we stumble and we injure ourselves. And some of us don't even return to the race because we get so messed up from the baggage that we are carrying. And now you and I aren't carrying bags full of books, but what we are carrying is emotional baggage, scars, that come from our life. So I want to show you um, some of this emotional baggage. Some of us go through our lives with abuse. We've experienced it. We've done it to other people. Physical abuse, sexual abuse. We're trying to run the Christian life, but we have abuse just destroying us, causing us to stumble. Maybe, maybe you don't have abuse in your life, but what you do have is dysfunction. Because let's be real, our families and our relationships at time are dysfunctional. Like, don't look at that person right now if you're sitting next to them, but at times people in your life, and maybe you yourself, are dysfunctional. When you have conflict, you run from it, you don't deal with it, you have broken relationships, and your life can be summed up by the word dysfunction. You're, you're dysfunctional. Maybe, maybe you're not dysfunctional, even though you are, you just don't like to admit it. But maybe in, in your life you are carrying the bag of addiction. Drug addiction, alcoholism, pornography, Netflix, food. That you're trying to run the Christian life, but as you run, this is one of the bags that you are carrying, a bag of addiction. Maybe for you it's not addiction or those, but it's divorce. Where you've experienced just the painful effects of divorce. You've experienced the pain either of your parents or you yourself got divorced and it was one of the, if not the most painful thing that you have been through in your life, and you are carrying this baggage in your Christian life. Maybe it's not divorce, but it's bitterness, right? So someone says one negative thing to you, and you pick up this bag because rather than forgiving them, you pick up this bag of bitterness, and we're all trying to run the Christian life, but we're trying to run it with all these bags in our hands, from bitterness to divorce to addiction to abuse, and to dysfunction. And what happens in the process is we injure ourselves, we injure those around us. And what you might find surprising when I talk about these bags is many of these bags aren't things that you even picked up on your own. Much of the emotional baggage that we carry in our life is a result of our family of origin. That without even knowing that you and I are living out the script that our parents handed down to us, and our parents are living out the script their parents handed down to us. And their parents are living out the script their parents handed down to us. That unconsciously we're living out this script that our parents hand down to us. Some of it's positive, some of it's negative. And, and matter of fact, we have scientists that debate this, okay? So, so they say the reason we, we live out this script is because it's due to nature, in other words, we are born into this world, pre-wired in our DNA to commit the same sin, to have the same rebellion as our parents did before us. They say it's nature, you're born with this gene. Other scientists say it's nurture. It's not because you're born this way, but it's because as a child, you see the way your parents respond to conflict. You see the way your parents treat one another, and because of that, you do likewise. It's due to nurture. Other scientists say, no, you, you both have it wrong. It's not either or, but it's both and. This is a result of nature, and it's a result of nurture. You're born with some of it, but a lot of it you see your parents do. A lot of it you see your family do. And so you just live out this script without knowing it. What I find interesting is, although scientists debate this fact, it was described in the Bible thousands of years ago. Um, by a show of hands, I want everyone to participate in all of our campuses. How many of you guys have heard of something called the Ten Commandments? Go ahead, put your hand up. Right, like even if you don't go to church, like this is the first time you've been to church in the past five years, 10 years, 15 years, you've probably heard of the Ten Commandments. Matter of fact, if I asked you what are the Ten Commandments, maybe you couldn't get all ten, but you could quote at least some of them. There is something interesting that we see in the Ten Commandments. The fact that we live out the script our parents hand down to us, we see that it's ultimately a mystery of God. So if you have your Bibles, I want you to see this. You can join me in Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. Go ahead and turn there. 
Exodus chapter 20, verses 4 through 5 say this. You'll recognize this first part. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. So when we read that, we think of the commandment, you shall not worship any other gods. You shall not make an image. You shall not worship a graven image. Like we, if you're a Christian, you recognize that command. But I want you to see what else God says. That he's a jealous God, that he's punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. I want you to notice just two things about this verse. One thing that may have stuck out to you is that God calls himself a jealous God. And maybe you're here today, you're not a Christian, you have questions about the Bible, like, aha, I got it. See, I was right when I thought that God is just this guy in the sky, and, and he gets extremely jealous, like, if I don't worship this God, he, he has a big ego, and he just sends me to hell. You prove it right there, Tyler, that he is a jealous God. You need to understand it's not the jealousy that we see as jealousy. If you have a spouse, wife or a husband, I want you to think about them committing an affair. Not just one affair, but multiple affairs all behind your back, all hiding it from you. When they talk to you, to your face, they say everything's good, I love you, but behind your back, they're cheating on you. You should feel a righteous jealousy in that moment. You should love your wife or your husband enough that you want them to be devoted to you, that you want to have a relationship with them and, and be devoted to them while they're devoted to you. And that's the same way that our God is jealous for his people. You see, our God loves you so much and he loves me so much that he doesn't want us to waste our affections on lesser pleasures, that our God provides the greatest pleasure. He is jealous for us because he wants a relationship with us. So if you're in one of our campuses and you're not a Christian, you need to hear that today, that God loves you, that he is jealous for you, that he desires a relationship with you. The other thing I want you to notice is the fact that the scriptures say that God punishes the children for the sin of their parents to the third and fourth generations. You see, when you, when you hear family, what many of us think of is our immediate family. Maybe your wife, your kids, maybe your mom, your dad, maybe some cousins. But we think of our immediate family. When the Bible speaks of family, it does speak of our immediate family, but it also speaks of three to four generations back. So when the Bible speaks of your family, it's going back roughly to the 1800s. In other words, what, what your family did back to the 1800s to today affects you. And it's not, we don't understand why this happens. It's not that the children are punished only because the parents sin, but really it's because the children follow in the same sin of their parents and they're punished for that fact. Maybe you're here today and you're like, Tyler, I don't believe the Bible. I, I don't believe this. Well, let's, let's look at science for a second because scientists are extremely interested in this. So there's been numerous studies on this fact. So th this is a fact from Scripture, but it's also backed up by science. And, and it says if, if one of these major events have happened in your life, you are far more likely to repeat it. So if your parents, your grandparents, or your great-grandparents experienced a divorce, if divorce is all throughout your family, marriage is falling apart, you are far more likely to have a divorce. You are far more likely to have your marriage fall apart. If in your life and in your family, alcoholism has destroyed men and women and children in your family, you are far more likely, if you experiment with alcohol, to become an alcoholic. If in your family it's like mine, and on one side of my family there's a lot of addiction. If you have addiction in your family, then there's a high chance that in those dark times when you feel like you're isolated, maybe tired, you're hungry, there's a, there's a good chance that you're going to turn to some type of addiction. Now, in your family, if there's sexual abuse or physical abuse, you are much more likely to commit that same abuse, which breaks my heart. When you talk to someone who's an abuser and you study their life and you go back to their childhood over and over again, they experienced abuse themselves. Without even knowing it, they're living out this horrific script that was handed down to them by someone in authority, by someone in their own family. If your family has a history of children running off, of children just disobeying authority and not wanting to follow the lead of anyone and they kind of run off and do their own thing and hurt themselves, then there's a higher chance that your children will do the same thing and that you 
will do the same thing. If in your family there's just an inability to sustain stable relationships, what I mean by that is if in your family when there's conflict, they either run from the conflict, they refuse to deal with it, they close up and they refuse to talk, or they attack the other person through gossip and slander, if that's in your family, there's a far, far, far higher chance that that's how you'll respond to conflict. You see, the, the sin and the rebellion that our families have committed, and by sin, I mean anything we think, anything we say, anything we do that's contrary to the Bible, we receive from our parents. And friends, I don't know if you re- realize this, but all of our families are dysfunctional. None of us come from a perfect family. Like some of our families are a little more broken than others, but all of our families are broken. All of our families are dysfunctional. And what happens? And once again, I want to see a show of hands in all of our campuses because I find this hilarious because I've said it myself. How many of you, maybe when you were a teenager, and maybe you're a teenager today and your parents are sitting next to you, so this might be awkward for you, okay? But how many of you at some point in time in your life made the statement, I will not be like my parents. Go ahead. I will not be like my parents. Anyone ever made that statement? Put your hand up. Okay, thank you for actually being honest. Right? We've all made that statement, especially as teenagers or young adults. We said, I will not be like my parents. And then what happens? Well, you mature a little bit. Maybe you have kids of your own. And maybe you're in a grocery store and your kid won't stop crying or your kid is throwing stuff out of your cart or throwing stuff in your cart and you respond to them in such a way and you have just a realization. I am just like my mom or I am just like my dad. Without even knowing it, we unconsciously repeat the same behavior as our parents. Without even knowing it, we we do the same pattern of living that our parents handed down to us. We're in a sermon series called Emotional IQ, and it's about finding spiritual and emotional wholeness. The first message, if you remember, we talked about iceberg spirituality. And what iceberg spirituality is, is if you see an iceberg in the water, you only see the top 10% of the iceberg. When you see an iceberg, it doesn't look that dangerous, right? The, The Titanic didn't think the iceberg was that big of a deal because it was just a little bit of ice. But underneath the water is where 90% of the iceberg lies. And underneath the water, that 90% of the iceberg is what causes damage. It's what causes emotional brokenness. It's what causes spiritual death. And the the dysfunction of our family and the script that our family hands down to us is part of that bottom 90%. We don't see it. But what we need to understand is it has devastating implications on our lives. Without recognizing the script our family has handed down to us, We simply live it out, and we continue that brokenness. The New Testament actually talks about this. Over and over and over again in the New Testament, we see that we are born into this world as slaves. We are born into this world as slaves, and the whole idea about a slave is if you are a slave, you are forced to obey a master, right? So we are born into this world slaves, and we're born in this world slaves to three things. First, we're slaves to Satan and his demons. Okay, this isn't politically correct, but you need to understand there is an unseen reality. There is a war going on around us that Satan is real. His demons are real. They are not equal with God. They're a creation of God. They're not equal with them, but they are real. And we're born into this world slaves to Satan and his demons without even realizing it. We're born into this world slaves to sin. And what I mean by that is since we're slaves, when we feel temptation, especially if you're not a Christian, when you feel temptation, you give in to it. We tell ourselves to follow our hearts. We tell ourselves to follow what what makes us happier. And we, we pursue this happiness that we believe our flesh can give us. And every single time we choose sin over God, we choose sin over God, and we are powerless to overcome it because we are slaves to that sin. We're also slaves to the world. And the Bible speaks of the world in two different ways. It speaks of it in a positive way, like in the Gospel of John, where it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son. But it also speaks of it like in the book of James. Don't you know that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? And that's the type of world that we're enslaved to. It's everything set up in the world that that causes us to turn from God. It's the lust that we see. 
It's the pride that we're encouraged to have. It's the ungodliness that we see in our culture. It's this world system that is set up to destroy our faith. And friends, when we are born into this world, we are born slaves to Satan and his demons. We are born slaves to sin, and we are born slaves to this world culture. And I want you to think for a minute back to your like 7th, 8th grade history class. I want you to think about slavery in the early United States. It was a very dark an evil time in our history. But I want you to put yourself in the shoes of a slave. You see, what would happen if you were a slave in the early United States? You had an extremely brutal life. You worked sun up to sun down for no pay. And often what you would try to do is escape slavery. So if you, if you tried to escape slavery, if you ran from your master, your master's house, and you tried to escape slavery, often you would be caught, and one of two things would happen. The first thing that might happen is you would be sold even further down south, further into slavery, to an even more cruel master. That might happen. The other thing that might happen is when your master catches you, he'll bring you back to the plantation, and he'll beat you without mercy without grace. They'll flog you. They'll whip you. They'll beat you with bats and rods. And what often happens is they'll beat you to the point of death. So if you tried to escape slavery, often one of those two things would happen to you. And what you would understand about slavery, if you're a slave in the early United States, is that slavery is passed from one generation to the next generation to the next generation. So I want you to imagine the pain of this moment. You're a slave and you find someone that you love, a husband, a wife, a spouse, and you get married and you have kids. Can you imagine the pain of looking into the face of your newborn baby? Like you're instantly in love with this baby, but you realize that this baby's future is slavery. You realize that this baby is doomed to live a brutal life, often a short life. You realize that this baby is going to face physical abuse and sexual abuse. You realize this baby is probably going to get beat. You realize this baby is probably going to get murdered. You brought this baby into the world and you're filled with joy, and yet you realize that slavery is going to be passed down to this baby because of your skin color, because of your ethnicity. Your slavery is passed from generation to generation, and You feel that you have no hope for this baby. You love the baby, but you almost feel guilty bringing it into the world because of the brutality of its life that it's going to face. And just like as an earthly master and an earthly slave, our slavery is passed from generation to generation. You see, this is where my analogy breaks down. If you are an earthly slave with an earthly master, you have an opportunity to escape. There were many slaves that were able to get out of their master's house, that they were able to use the Underground Railroad, that they were able to follow the stars and head north, and they were able to find freedom from their own strength, from their own willpower. But friends, what you need to understand is that you and I are born into this world as slaves, slaves to Satan and his demons, slaves to sin, and slaves to the world. And this type of slavery, we cannot free ourselves. You cannot, in your own power, outrun your master. In your own power, you can't disobey this slavery. In your own power, you cannot find freedom. But we try so often. Oh, do we try. When we look at the New Testament, we see people trying to escape the slavery to sin. We see two kinds of people. We see Pharisees. Okay, and the Pharisees were the religious leaders of Jesus' day. And see, they recognized that they were born into this world as slaves. And so in order to free themselves, they would spend hours studying the Bible. They would, they would memorize this book, the Old Testament, the first part of the Bible. They would have it memorized by heart. And they felt if they could just obey God's law perfectly, then they could escape slavery. And so in order to do that, they came up with a list of their own laws. And they thought, we need these laws so we don't accidentally break God's law. But what they didn't realize is in the process of trying to escape slavery, they sold themselves to an even crueler master, and that master is called religion. Maybe that's where many of you are at today, where you realize how screwed up you are, and you're trying to fix yourself by being religious. 
You're trying to fix yourself by reading the Bible enough times, by praying enough times, by giving enough money, by attending church, by serving. You're trying to free yourself from slavery by being religious. But what you have probably realized by now is you can never live up to the standard you set for yourself. You see, God's standard is perfection and we fall short. So if you have sold yourself to the master of religion, what has happened in your life is your heart is filled with guilt Your heart is filled with condemnation. Your heart is filled with shame because you constantly fall short. A far crueler master. But maybe you didn't take that route. There's a second route we see people in the Bible take, and the Bible simply refers to these people as sinners. These are the people Jesus actually chose to hang out with over the religious people. But maybe you've taken the path of sinning or rebellion. What I mean by that is you, you looked at God's law and you, maybe you attended church when you were a kid and, and thought this book was just a bunch of laws that you could not obey. So you're like, you know what? If I'm going to sin, I'm going to sin all the way. And you thought you could find freedom by throwing off the standard that God has given you. You thought you could find freedom by choosing your own path, by following your passion, by following your happiness, by following temptation. You thought you could find freedom by choosing sin, and yet you were also sold to an even crueler master where it offered life this master, but in the end it brings death. It offers life, but in the end it brings bondage. It offers life, but in the end it brings addiction. You see, friend, when we try to free ourselves from slavery, we either choose religion and try to follow a list of rules and try to save ourselves, or we choose rebellion and say, you know what, God? Your law is too too big. I can't can't follow it, so I'm going to choose sin. Those are the paths that we often take. Let's go back to slavery in the early United States for a second. If you were a slave and you were going to escape a plantation, you didn't really have a map, right? Like, you know you had to go north, but you didn't have a map. So what you would do is you would find something unchangeable. You would, you would look to the North Star, and you would travel under the cover of darkness, and you would keep walking towards the North Star, hoping eventually you would find freedom. Friend, what you need to understand is our freedom only comes from outside of us. We can't find freedom through our willpower or through our strength. We are too weak. We are too broken. We are born as slaves. We cannot save ourselves. We need to set our eyes on the North Star. We need to set our eyes not on the star, but on the King of Kings, on Jesus Christ. We need to set our eyes on the perfection of Jesus. We need to set our eyes on the gospel. So if you have your notes, this is the main point of this message. So if you forget everything else, remember this point, and it's this. The gospel brings freedom from my past. The gospel brings freedom from my past. Friends, we need to understand that healing only comes when we expose all of our life to the power of the gospel. And the gospel is kind of a word that Christians throw around. I don't don't want to pretend like you know what it is. So gospel literally means good news. Okay, but this is the gospel. God created you and God created I to be in relationship with him. Right? God created us in the Garden of Eden as whole people, as people made in his image, as people made for a relationship with him because God loves us. But then we rebelled against God. We disobeyed God. We sinned against God. And sin broke our relationship with God. Matter of fact, it killed it, that because of our sin, we are spiritually dead, unable to respond to God. And every single one of us has sinned against God. Every single one of us has rebelled against God. It is treason against the God of the universe. And every single one of us has done it, probably on a regular basis. And I'm speaking for myself. So we have sinned, and sin breaks this relationship with God. But then the beautiful message of the gospel is God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You see, God loves us so much that God became a man in the person and work of Jesus Christ, that that Jesus was fully God and fully man, and Jesus faced the temptation you face, and he faced the temptation I face, but he was without sin. So every single time Jesus was tempted, he said no to sin and yes to God. No to sin and yes to God. He did the opposite of what we did. Jesus lived a life you and I could not live. He lived a perfect life. And then he allowed his own creation out of his love for them and out of his love for you and me, he allowed himself to be whipped, flogged. He allowed himself to be tortured and mocked. 
He allowed himself to be spat on where at any time he could have called an army of angels to rescue him. But out of his love for you and his love for me, he went to the cross and they took nine inch nails and put them through his wrists and his ankles. And at that moment on the cross, he felt not only the physical pain, but he experienced God's wrath for all of your sin and all of my sin and the sin of the whole world, past, present, and future at one time. And he cried out, it is finished. And he died and he was buried in a tomb. And three days later, this God, Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords, resurrected from the dead, showing that he has victory over sin. He has victory over Satan and his demons. He has victory over this world. And he has come to set captives free. Friends, that's the message of the gospel. That's the message that our faith is built on. And sometimes I talk to Christians, and this drives me crazy. They say, you know what, Tyler? Um, I've heard the gospel enough. I, I want to move on to other things. Friends, there is no other thing. All of our spiritual growth, all of our emotional wholeness, all of this comes from the gospel. All of this comes from the message that Jesus lived the life we could not live, died the death we deserved to die, and resurrected from the dead, victorious over sin, Satan, and the world. That's what our faith is built on. What the gospel shows us is that we aren't bad people who need to be made good. We're not good people who need to be made better. Friends, we are dead people who need to be born again. We are dead people who need new life. There's a big difference there. What the gospel shows us is that we can't find healing by looking deep within ourselves. We can't find healing by finding ourselves and just searching through ourselves. We can only find healing from an outside source, from the power of the gospel, from Jesus Christ. That's the only place that we can find healing. You see, friends, religion comes close. But religion is a list of do's. Religion is a list of rules that if you don't obey these rules, God is not happy with you. Religion says do, but Jesus says done. Jesus did everything. He said it is finished. We can't add to it. That's the difference between religion and Jesus. And many of us have sold ourselves to religion. And Jesus is saying, it's not do, do, do. It's I've done everything. I've done all of it. That's the power of the gospel. And one of the most incredible truths about the gospel is when Jesus ascended to be with the Father, he sent the Holy Spirit to live inside of us. You see, we believe that there is one God who exists eternally as three distinct persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And you're like, Tyler, that, what? That, that doesn't make sense. Here's the thing. God is infinite. We are finite. But I love theology. So if you're like, how is God a trinity? We can have a five-hour, like, talk over coffee. Just send me an email. We can get together, and we can have a Bible study on God being trinity. But the thing about the Holy Spirit is he is fully God, and he lives inside of us. We often don't talk about the Holy Spirit in church, and it's a shame he empowers us for mission. What you need to understand about the Holy Spirit is this, this is a reality that no one experienced before Jesus. So all the people in the Old Testament, all the prophets from Moses to Joshua to Isaiah, they, they prayed for a time where all of God's people would be filled with the Spirit of God, and we are witnessing that now. We have the Holy Spirit within us, so we no longer have to go to a sacred building with a sacred teacher up front. Instead, we can teach each other. Because the Holy Spirit is our teacher. The Holy Spirit is our counselor. It's an incredible truth that God himself lives inside of us. And this is what Paul is talking about in the book of Romans. If you have your Bible, you can turn to Romans 8 with me. And I just want to give you some context. The book of Romans was written to the early church in Rome just a few decades after Jesus' death. And this is a church that Paul has never met, but Paul has heard that they have distorted the gospel. They have lost the gospel. So the whole book of Romans is Paul laying out the gospel for them. And in my opinion, the book of Romans is the greatest book in all of the Bible. It is a rhetorical, literary masterpiece. And through it, Paul just lays out, this is what the gospel means for the Christian life. This is what the gospel means for us today. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Romans chapter 8 starting in verse 15. Romans chapter 8, verse 15. This is what Paul says. The Spirit, and this is the Holy Spirit, okay? The Spirit of the Holy Spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. That was the, where we came from. If you're not a Christian, you're still in slavery. If you are a Christian, you used to be a slave. The Holy Spirit doesn't make us slaves to fear again, but rather, or instead, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. 
And by him we cry, Abba, Father. What I want you to notice in that passage is that you and I, if you're a Christian, you have been adopted into a brand new family. Think with me for a second how incredible that is. If I was God, let me tell you what I would do. I would look down like the corridor of time and I would find the moral people like, you know, your grandma. Like I would choose your grandma, I wouldn't choose you. Like I would find the moral people throughout history. I would find the people who do all the good things. I would find the people who are significant, who have influence. And if I was God, I would choose them. And yet God chooses drug addicts. God chooses alcoholics. God chooses people who are obsessed with themselves. God chooses people who are filled with pride. God chooses people who have experienced divorce. God chooses people who are filled with bitterness. God chooses insignificant people to shame the people who think they're significant. God chooses the weak to shame the strong. God does all of this so that no one can boast in his presence because, friends, salvation isn't based on who you are. It's based on who Jesus is. Salvation isn't about you. It's about Jesus. Everything in this life is about Jesus. This book is not about you. It's about Jesus. You're not the hero of your story. Jesus is. He's the King of kings, the Lord of lords, and he's our Redeemer. It's all about Jesus. And because of Jesus, you have been adopted into God's family in the midst of your brokenness, in the midst of your sin, in the midst of your dysfunction. God has adopted you. And it says the Holy Spirit within us allows us to call out Abba, Father. That word Abba is a very intimate term that Many people wouldn't use to describe God. It would be a Jewish boy talking to his dad. But because of the Holy Spirit living inside of us, and because of the gospel, we can experience the same intimacy with God that Jesus experienced. Think about that for a moment. By the Spirit, we've we've, we've been adopted into this family. We can cry out, Abba, Father, because of the Holy Spirit who lives inside of us. Now look at this next couple of verses. What you're going to see in these next verses is because of your adoption, In my adoption, we have received a new inheritance. Look at verse 16. The Spirit, once again, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. You are God's son. You are God's daughter. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. Friends, all of us have inherited brokenness from our family. All of us have inherited sin from our family of origin, but what God wants you to hear today is you have a new family. What God wants you to hear today is that you have received a brand new inheritance. I read uh, this past week about a man named Thomas Martinez, if I'm saying that name right. He is a man who used to live, he may still live in Santa Cruz, and he was a homeless man. And when I say homeless, I mean he was incredibly broke. Um, His day consisted of trying to figure out how he's going to get enough money to get a few loaves of bread. He also had a drug problem, so his day also consisted of how is he going to find the next high, how is he going to get the next fix. And on a seemingly normal day, two police officers approached him. Okay, So here's Tomas. He sees two cops coming towards him. He thinks they're going to arrest him, so he takes off running. He, he runs away from the cops. They, they never find him again. He probably still thinks the police are after him. No one has found him. But... What the cops were going to tell him is, hey, Tomas, you have a $6 million inheritance because your ex-wife died. And he ran from that. Friends, that's how many of us live the Christian life, where we have this incredible inheritance available because of Jesus, and we're running the other way. We, We live as Christians for maybe 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, and this whole time, we don't realize we have been adopted into a new family. We don't realize that God is our heir. We don't realize that we have received this new inheritance. It's a strange story, this story about Tomas, but oh, how it's so true of you and me. We have received a new inheritance inheritance. I want to give you just some three really practical things you can do in order to find freedom from your past, in order to find freedom from this generational sin in your life. So if you have your notes, you can write these down. The first thing that we need to do together as a church and you need to do in your own life is acknowledge that I have been adopted into God's family. And friends, your adoption isn't based on what you've done. It's based on what Jesus has done. It's not based on who you are, it's based on who Jesus is. And because you have been adopted into a new family by the power of the gospel, then you have the freedom of being honest about your struggles. 
You have the freedom of being completely honest about the sin your family passed down to you and about the sin that you passed down to your children. You see, we're adopted into God's family and we cannot be unadopted because our salvation isn't based on us, it's based on Jesus. We don't earn it, Jesus did it all so we can't lose it. So we have the security when we acknowledge that we've been adopted into a new family to be honest about our sin, to be honest about our brokenness. The next thing that you need to do is identify the generational sin in my family. Identify the generational sin in my family. You need to understand that there's a, there's a theological principle called already, but not yet. So in other words, you have already been adopted into God's family. You've already been saved. You've already received an inheritance, and yet it's not yet. We see this when Paul says you need to work out your salvation. It's past tense, but work out your salvation with fear and trembling. So we've already been saved. We've already been adopted, and yet we need to work it out in our own lives. And part of that is identifying the generational sin in my family. Uh, A few months ago, I got my second tattoo, hopefully one of many. Just don't tell my wife, but hopefully one of many. So my second tattoo is right here. It's a Greek word. It says kairos. It means the opportune moment in time. But the thing about a tattoo is when you get a tattoo, it's considered an open, an open wound because of the needle and the ink. And so when you get a tattoo, you have to take a special kind of lotion and put it on the tattoo throughout the day so that it doesn't dry up. If you don't do that, your tattoo will get scarred, the ink will leak out, it might get infected, it's not going to be pretty, right? So when I left the tattoo place, they told me, you need to take this, you need to apply it to yourself to heal your tattoo. Now, yes or no, if I take this lotion and say, okay, I'm supposed to apply this lotion to myself, so I take this lotion and I just rub it all over my neck. Like, is it going to heal my tattoo? No, I I would look look foolish, right? If I took the lotion, applied it to my tattoo, and said, well, uh, I applied it to my body, it should heal my tattoo. No, my tattoo is going to get messed up. In order to find healing, I have to apply it to my tattoo, to that specific wound on my body. And it's the same with the generational sin. As we believe the gospel, we need to apply the gospel to specific areas of our lives, to that 90% of us that other people don't see, beginning with the generational sin that's handed down to us from our families. Um, In your notes for today, in your bulletin, you have a handout called the Genogram Worksheet. And and a genogram just helps you identify the sin of your family, helps you identify the positive and the negative aspects of your family. It's a list of questions for you to think through, and it's not an easy process. It takes time. But if you want to find healing from generational sin, if you want to find healing from this script that your family gave down to, if you want to leave a positive legacy rather than a negative legacy for your children, this is something that you have to do. So I, I want you this week to set aside time. And before you even begin the genogram, spend some time just praying, maybe reading a passage of Scripture and thinking how this applies to you. And pray that God would open your eyes. And when he does that, be brutally honest about your family. I know it's painful. I know it hurts. And one of the things that might help for you is to sit down with a trusted friend and have them guide you through the process. So if there's someone in your connection group that that you just click with, ask them to help you go through the process. If you don't have anyone in your life that is a mature Christian, talk to your campus pastor, and I'm sure they would love to sit down with you and help you go through that genogram process. But it's through identifying our generational sin and then bringing the power of the gospel to it by by acknowledging our adoption in that area, by acknowledging that we're saved not based on what we do, but based on what Jesus has done, by acknowledging our new inheritance where we find freedom. But we have to identify the specific sin. And then finally, confess my sin to God, and to others. One of the beautiful promises of the gospel is that if we confess our sin, God is faithful and just to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Jesus paid God's wrath so we don't have to. Jesus paid the full price. So when you confess your sin to God, you are completely forgiven. That God doesn't look at you based on your sin, but he looks at you based on Jesus' perfection. So you confess your sin to God, but so often, In order to find true healing, we need to confess our sin to other people. The book of James says, confess your sin to each other and pray for each other so that you might be healed. Healing often only comes through authentic, life-giving community. So I want to encourage you, if you're in the connection group, when you go to your connection group this week, determine to be completely honest about where you're at in your journey. Determine to be completely honest about the script your family has handed down to you. 
Confess your sin to God, confess your sin to other people, and find mercy, grace, and healing. But friends, we need to understand this isn't a one-time process. Martin Luther, and you probably don't realize this, but the rescue church itself really finds its beginning in the Protestant Reformation. And Martin Luther, who you may have heard of, um, in the 1500s, he nailed his 95 thesis to a church door in Wittenberg, Germany. And the first thesis was this, all of the Christian life is one of repentance. This isn't a one-time process where we go through these three steps and we're freed. This is something we do on a regular basis, just like my tattoo. I had to keep applying the lotion throughout the day. The gospel is something we need to apply every single day. The gospel is something we need to meditate on throughout the day. The Christian life Life is one of confessing sin and then repentance. And what repentance is, is when we turn from our sin and we turn to the perfection and the beauty and the glory and the joy of Jesus. The Christian life is one of repentance. So friends, this week as you fill out that genogram, as you acknowledge that you've been adopted into God's family, as you receive this new inheritance available to you, not because of who you are, but because of who Jesus is, I encourage you to be brutally honest. And it's not going to happen right away. It takes time, but you will begin to find healing for the emotional scars. You'll begin to be able to drop off this emotional baggage and run the race that God has given you with endurance, making much of Jesus rather than much of yourself. Let's pray and just ask the Holy Spirit to lead us. Father, we are all broken people. And Father, as we look over our families, our families are filled with brokenness and dysfunction and addiction and bitterness. But Father, I thank you that because of Jesus Christ, we have been set free by the power of the gospel. So Holy Spirit, I'm asking that right now, would you move in the hearts of your people? Father, I pray for anyone here who does not have a relationship with you. Lord, I pray the gospel would show them how much you love them and that today they can take those first steps in following you and finding healing and finding freedom. Jesus, you made the promise that you came to set the captives free. And we proclaim that promise today, Lord. We are captives so often to our sin. And we're asking you, Jesus, please set us free by your power, not our power. It's in the name of Jesus Christ the crucified and yet risen King, the Lord of Lords, our Redeemer, the one who sets us free, that we pray all these things. Amen. Thank you for listening to this recent message from The Rescue Church. You can listen to more past messages at therescuechurch.com.